you, you mentioned this last night, but we, we need to hear this over and over again because many in the church believe that the earth is only, you know, 6,000 years old. So you're busting out these numbers that are way bigger than that. So with the Genesis account of creation, can you again help us understand your view of how the earth is much older than just 6,000 years old? Well, keep in mind I'm an astronomer, so those numbers are not considered to be very impressive at all. Uh, in fact, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a young universe, old universe debate, and it was generated by astronomers who said, Big Bang cosmology is only giving us billions of years. That's not enough time to sustain any kind of materialistic or Darwinian idea of the evolution of life. And so a group of astronomers were promoting the idea that the universe was over a quadrillion years old. But eventually the evidence became overwhelming. It's only billions of years old. So I actually call myself a young universe uh, creationist. I only believe in billions, not quadrillions. But I get the point. Some people actually think these days in Genesis 1 are six consecutive 24-hour periods. Now, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't really get to meet Christians to get to know them until I showed up at Caltech to do postdoctoral research. But I started reading the Bible seriously when I was 17. And I started on page one. And immediately I recognized that this word day must have at least three distinct literal definitions because three are used in the text. On creation day one, the word day is used uh, to contrast days and nights. That's the word day for the daylight hours. On creation day four, it's contrasting seasons, days, and years. That's day is 24 hours. But Genesis 2, 4 uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day as a long period of time. The other thing I notice is the first six days are bracketed by an evening and a morning, indicating that each of those first six days has a definite beginning point and a definite ending point. But I expected to see an evening in the morning for the seventh day. It's not there in the text. There is no evening and morning for day seven. As you read on in the Bible, you find three texts, Psalm 95, John 5, and Hebrews 4, that tell us we're still in God's seventh day. Now, and I appreciated that at age 17, for me, it was a huge lightning light bulb event for me. Because something that had plagued me since I was 10 and a half was the fossil record enigma. How we see all the speciation before human beings and virtually none afterwards. I asked all my scientist friends, could you please explain why? They didn't give me an answer. The first time I picked up the Bible, I said, this answers the fossil record enigma. For six days, God creates that explains all the speciation events before humanity. On day seven, he stops creating. That explains why we don't see it in the human era. And so for six days, God creates. On the seventh day, he stops creating. And a number of Bible scholars have also pointed out that Genesis 1 makes it clear that God creates both the human male and the human female on creation day six. But when you look at Genesis chapter two, God creates Adam first, has him go through three careers before he creates Eve. I mean, he's got to work the garden, he's got to engage all these uh, animals uh, and to give them appropriate names. And uh, then the text says that God noticed that Adam was lonely, and it takes more than a few seconds to be lonely, at least for most men. Uh, <clears throat> And so, finally, God creates Eve. And what does the text say comes out of Adam's mouth? It's the Hebrew word, hapa'am. It's used 20 times in the Old Testament, almost always translated at long last. So many Bible scholars have pointed out, day six, likewise, must be a long time period. And the grammatical structure would point out that all the days, hence. So we're looking at six consecutive long periods of time and hence, there is no contradiction between the time scale of geophysics and astrophysics and the time scale of the Bible. It's one and the same. God reveals himself through two books. Article 2 of the Belgic Confession makes that clear. It's one of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll go right down here and start with you, Butch. 
Hi, Dr. Ross. Um, I have a question. Uh, global warming seems to be a very hot topic going on right now, and I just wanted to get your views on it. Is, is it something that we should be concerned about going forward? And uh, if you could just talk about that for a minute. Well, what I've done in my book, Weathering Climate Change, is basically make the point we need to understand the climate stability we're enjoying right now is the extreme exception. It's not the norm, it's the exception. It takes phenomenal design on the part of our creator to make this even possible. So we need to see this as a gift. But we also need to appreciate that in Genesis 1 and in Job 37, 38, and 39, God gave us a command. We humans are to manage the planet for our benefit and the benefit of all life, which means that God has designed the planet and put resources on the planet where we don't have to choose between our economic benefit and the benefit of all other life on planet Earth. And that's what's making global warming such a hot political debate, because one side says we need to give priority to the human well-being, the other side says, well, what about the rest of all life? The truth is there are win-win solutions where we can boost the economy of the world's population and at the same time extend the stability of the climate that we have. So I've got two chapters in the book basically laying out about 40 different ways that we can stabilize the climate and at the same time put money, more money in everybody's pockets. I mean, trying to tell people to uh, uh, you know, contract their standard of living by a factor of four doesn't take into account the biblical principle, human beings are fundamentally selfish. And so getting them to cut their standard of living by a factor of four, you're not going to sell that. And even if you were to sell it here in the U.S., you're not going to sell it worldwide. People are going to cheat. And so what we need to do is motivate people, but motivate them through their economy. There are things we can do to stabilize the climate that actually increase uh, the human economic uh, status, not decrease it. And I don't think anybody's going to vote against that. No matter what party you favor, you're going to like this offer, that, uh, this kind of solution. Hello again, Dr. Ross. Hello. Um, I'm curious if you're familiar with the uh, Reichardt structure in uh, western part of Africa, um, just because of, um, sorry, western part of Africa and its connection to the possible possibility of the city of Atlantis. Yeah, what was that last phrase? Oh, um, city the city of, of uh, Atlantis, the oh, right the structure thing. in Western Africa. Yeah, well, you'll see Atlantis legends literally all over the world. It's not just in Greece uh, or in Africa. It's everywhere you hear these Atlantis stories. And this is because there were humans living during the last ice age. And during the last ice age, the sea level was 390 feet lower than what it is today, which would have exposed land masses that today are covered by oceans. So we're not just looking at one Atlantis, there were many Atlantises all over the Earth. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised that we see these stories and legends embedded not just in one culture, but in dozens of cultures all over the world. 390 feet, that's uh, quite a drop in sea level. I got one here on the uniqueness of the moon. Can you just speak a little bit on the uniqueness of Earth's moon? Well, we astronomers know of a couple of hundred different moons uh, in our solar system. We're now beginning to discover them in planetary systems beyond ours. Uh, but what we've noticed is that our moon sticks out like a sore thumb. The mass of our moon relative to its host planet it's 50 times bigger than any other known moon. And also, our moon is relatively close to our planet. And it's the proximity of the moon and its enormous mass compared to the mass of Earth that stabilizes the tilt of our rotation axis. So I was mentioning earlier our rotation axis is dropping down towards 22 degrees. It varies between 24.5 and 22.1. When it drops down to 22.1, we get colder. When it goes up to 24.5, we get warmer. But it only gets slightly warmer and slightly more cool. What's typical of other planets is rotation axis varies like this. Mars, for example, 
its rotation axis tilt varies by 60 degrees, not just two degrees. And because of that, we have extreme climate instability. That is one of the reasons why life is not possible on Mars. But that's what's typical of planets all over uh, our galaxy and throughout the universe. The only way you can stabilize the tilt of rotation axis is to have a single small moon orbited by a really big moon not too far away. The other benefit we get from the moon is that uh, before the formation of the moon, our planet was rotating really rapidly. In fact, the moon formation event actually sped up the rotation rate to about two or three hours a day. Now, with that kind of rotation, you're going to get uh, weather patterns that will be extremely laminar, which means only a small percentage of your planet is going to get precipitation. And so, thanks to the moon's gravity, it actually exerted tidal forces on the Earth that gradually slowed down our rotation period. And so, since the moon formation event uh, three point, uh, well, 4.45 billion years ago, it has slowed the rotation rate down to 24 hours a day. Remarkably, that 24 hours a day is what is best for human civilization. 23 would be a problem, 25 would be a problem, 24 is optimal, and that moon slowed down a rotation rate to 24 hours per day at exactly the same time that the moon or the sun reached its maximum solar luminosity stability. I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, we happen to have the optimal uh, solar luminosity exactly the same time, thanks to the moon, we get the optimal rotation rate. Hello, Hugh. Uh, I was thinking a lot about how you're talking about that we're living in like the exact time for us to be able to have billions of people and sustain life. But it's, it seems like you're teaching that God placed us here knowing that we would have a limited amount of time uh, because of a coming ice age or the soul, the sun burning us up or, or whatever. So, but it's interesting to me how that when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, they also could have had access to the tree of life if they would have not fallen into sin. And when they did sin, they were cast out of the garden and God said, let's get them out of here. Otherwise, if they eat from the tree of, the, of life, they'll live forever. So I'm just curious what you, what you do with that. Well, I deal with that in some depth in the book Navigating Genesis, basically making the point that when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that's when they became spiritually dead. They were physically alive, but spiritually dead. And so the reason why God blocked access to the tree of life, he didn't want them to be eternally physically alive and eternally spiritually dead. And so what happened when he took away access to the tree of life, he now set in motion the tool of using physical death to deliver us from the far worse consequence of spiritual death. We humans often think of physical death as a bad thing. That's not how the Bible treats it. Physical death is a gift. And moreover, uh, a special gift is God doesn't have us live that long. I mean, if you actually read what was going on in the days before Noah, people had the potential to live eight or 900 years. But if you've got people living eight or 900 years uh, where many are spiritually dead to the point of being reprobate murderers, now you have an out-of-control murder rate. Instead of a serial killer living only 50 years or 60 years, you've got a serial killer living eight or 900 years. And that explains why, by the time of Noah, there was only one righteous family left. Because after all, if you're a serial killer, who are you going to kill? Not other serial killers. You're going to be killing the easy marks, the righteous people. And so you'll see a calculation in Navigating Genesis where I show that in the days before the flood, the murder rate was north of 95%. And so when you look at those patriarchs that lived to be eight or 900 years, they were the rare exceptions that escaped murder by their fellow human beings. Most people were having their lives terminated at age 20, 30, or 40 by being murdered by their fellow man. And so basically we have a lesson there. It's not good for us human beings to live hundreds of years we're far better off living only decades. Decades are sufficient time to establish the virtue of righteous people, more than sufficient time, but it also limits 
uh, what wicked people can do uh, in terms of making life more miserable uh, for the righteous. So we actually today have the optimal lifespan. I also argue that humans today have the longest average lifespan. On average, we're living longer today than people before the flood who had the potential to live to be 970. It's because we have a much lower murder rate that uh, you know, we have a higher average uh, lifespan. But again, the whole message of the New Testament is the only way you can truly live is to physically die. And likewise, we have God sending the creator of the universe to come to earth as a human being, and he physically dies so that we could all spiritually live uh, for the rest of eternity. Keep in mind, when the demons fell, there was no pathway for redemption. But when we fell, because God took away the tree of life, a pathway was opened up where we could be redeemed from our sin and evil, not just temporarily, but permanently. <clears throat> When the human genomes were laid out in one of the Scandinavian... When the young what were laid out? When the human genomes were yeah. laid out for one of the Scandinavian countries, what they discovered was one or more people had the genes of Cro-Magnon man. How was that possible? Okay, it's, they had the genes of Neanderthals. Uh, Cro-Magnons are identical to human beings. That's why the term has disappeared from the scientific literature, because we realize there's no difference between Cro-Magnons and humans. But there is a difference between humans and Neanderthals. Uh, now, 26% of our DNA is identical to daffodils. 99% of your DNA is identical to Neanderthals. But the 1% difference establishes that we're a distinct species from the Neanderthals. Now, uh, there's been papers published saying that uh, Scandinavians have more similarity in their DNA with Neanderthals than what people do in Sub-Saharan Africa. Those studies are still being disputed. So it's not established, it's not compelling, but there is evidence uh, that, and you'll see this in the literature, that maybe ancient humans were interbreeding uh, with Neanderthals. Uh, but there's also been scientists pointing out Neanderthals lived in the north and uh, their bodies were designed for a cold climate. Where do Scandinavians live? They also live in the north. And maybe these DNA similarities are simply due to the geography in which these Neanderthals and Scandinavians were living. So, for example, there's an advantage in having a fair skin uh, if you're living in a northern latitude. And there's evidence that Neanderthals had a fair skin. Uh, there's evidence that they might have had red hair. Uh, and again, that's something that you would expect for people living in northern climes. My colleague, uh, Dr. Fazal Rana, our staff biochemist, he's actually produced a DVD where he shows, for example, the racial distinctions amongst us human beings. If you take people living in the tropics with dark skin and dark hair and move them to a high latitude, in as little as four generations, you can change their skin color and their hair color. And so these are not major genetic differences. And so again, genetics is a very complex science where we don't even know what the systematic effects are, let alone the systematic errors. And I'm not saying there's no evidence, but I'm saying it's not compelling evidence. Moreover, it wouldn't disturb me as a Christian if indeed some limited amount of interbreeding happened after all, when you look at the book of Leviticus, the most stringent command given there to us human beings is to avoid bestiality. Why? Because that has the possibility of damaging the image of God. And it wouldn't surprise me if Satan and his demons uh, were trying to uh, foster this kind of bestiality in an attempt to damage the image of God. But one thing we know from the genetic evidence, even if interbreeding took place, it was at a level far below bestiality with apes that occurs today, which means that there would be no impact on the image of God. Either way, the image of God is protected. But again, this is an open question, and it's something we address in our book, Who is Adam? This question is about evolution, and do you discount all forms of evolution? No, I do not discount all forms of evolution. I mean... 
there is a di difference between microevolution and macroevolution. The term evolution fundamentally means change with respect to time. And there's no doubt, for example, that bacteria experience microevolution. That's why we have problems with antibiotic uh, defenses, because these bacteria uh, are going to undergo microevolution. Even we human beings have undergone microevolution. The average height of human beings 2,000 years ago of men was about five feet tall. Uh, today, it's closer to six feet tall. And it's the fact that, uh, you know, uh, people tend to prefer taller people in marriage, and moreover, our diet is better today, and so people are taller than they were. Probably the greatest microevolution in human beings has been eyesight. Uh, in the days of the Roman Empire, uh, people with good eyesight uh, were, had about two and a half times less acuity than people with good eyesight today. How did that happen? Well, in the days before glasses, uh, if you didn't have acute eyesight, you had a much higher probability of being killed in battle because you wouldn't see where the arrows are coming from or where the spears are coming from. And so, over time, uh, human eyesight became more acute. But that's all microevolution. We're still human beings. Macroevolution is the idea or the hypothesis that you can take a genus or an order or a species and have it evolve into a dramatically different uh, family or order or genus or species. Now, again, we see some of that at a limited scale uh, for bacteria and for insects. That's to be expected because those are species of life that have a huge population and a very short generation time. So microevolution can do a lot more. <clears throat> However, if we look at mammals, there were over 8,000 different mammal species when God created Adam and Eve. Today, there's only 4,000. Half of them have gone extinct. How many new mammal species have showed up to replace the 4,000 plus that have gone extinct? The answer is zero. The seventh day is when God stops creating. So if we actually do our biology research on day seven, the human era, this is where we get dramatic evidence that uh, the history of life has to be supernatural. We're simply not seeing what's necessary to sustain a naturalistic interpretation during the human era. And mammals would be the most dramatic example. In fact, we cite a number of studies in the book Improbable Planet where they've done field studies on mammals. If the adult body weight is greater than seven pounds, that species goes extinct before it can evolve into a different species. And, you know, lots of mammals. That, by the way, explains why all the bipedal primate species have to be special creation events. Because every one of them, you've got an adult's body size north of seven pounds. I'm gonna go ahead and also cap the lines. And so these lines here, we'll, we'll just keep it at this and then end after these. Go ahead, Bela. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for coming Hi. out again. Um, I'm the guy that always has to have his question mapped out in front of him. Um, so with respect to people, um, showing things that happen in the universe and talking about how this is a miracle or it's not. Um, we know that God made the universe to be what we call the natural universe, so it's not surprising that we find natural explanations for things that occur, even though at one point in time we don't know the explanation. Someone might say it's God. Later we find the natural explanation. And um, with respect to um, the comets hitting us, you call them, you know, they're coming in like darts aimed right at us. I suspect that if we were to trace that comet back, you know, millions of years, um, we're not going to find a point in time where all of a sudden the comet's going this way and then, whoop, it goes that way towards Earth, like, oh, that's where God nudged it, you know. Um, so, uh, surely God could do that, but um, I, I feel like the, there, someone could give a natural explanation for the comets hitting the Earth as well, which means if uh, everything would have to be traced back to the very beginning when God made the universe, at that time, if it was a Big Bang or whatever, when God set all that stuff into motion, he had every single detail worked out where, you know, this, this amount of time is going to go by, this thing's going to turn into this, turn into this, turn into this, turn into a comet, go this way, hit the earth here at this point in time at this place on the earth, which is amazing, right? Um, but um, so if this line of thought is applied to the, the, how we find the, 
what happened at the origin of the universe, whether it be, you know, someone says, look, it was a quantum fluctuation or whatever. Should we be surprised if we find a natural explanation for our natural universe? One. Okay, those are two good questions. And with respect to the asteroids, <clears throat> the response in the scientific literature was one of utter amazement. Why? Because we know what the natural asteroid collision rate is on Earth. And with these kinds of big asteroids, you get something like that every 20 million years or every 30 million years. We got three of them within two and a half million years. And the fact that they hit at just the right time and location and at just the right composition and size to make possible this enormous benefit for human beings explains why the scientific community, first of all, rejected this as it can't possibly be. This is way out of bounds of what we expect from asteroid collisions. And uh, then the fact that we couldn't find the craters. Uh, but what's happened in the past few weeks, as they said, you know, without all this, we wouldn't even be here to write our scientific papers. So I'm not saying this is causing all these scientists to become Christians, but it is causing them to say in their papers, this is utterly astounding, it's amazing, and isn't it wonderful, it's all for our benefit. So. And that's about the best I would expect from a non-theistic scientist writing on these things. But that's the context, is that asteroid collisions happen very infrequently here on planet Earth. And to get such three big ones so close together in time, all hitting at just the right time and just the right place, this is what's getting the attention of the scientific community. Your second point is actually a huge study going on in the uh, physics and astronomy literature. This whole point is, okay, uh, the space-time theorems tell us that the universe has a beginning, even a beginning of space and time, but we don't know everything about the universe. And so you've got a group of atheist physicists, uh, Sean Carroll in particular at Caltech, who are speculating, well, maybe in that region of ignorance, things are so radically different that there might be a possible loophole around the beginning of the universe uh, maybe the space-time theorems don't hold in the quantum uh, gravity uh, era. And uh, the quantum gravity era is the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the cosmic creation event. And what Sean Carroll points out, we'll never have a particle accelerator powerful enough to tell us what's going on there. And so he looks at that as uh, a license to speculate. And so he's produced what he called the quantum eternity theorem, but it's based on the quantum space-time fluctuations and the quantum gravity era being really enormous. And there's a Christian theoretical physicist, Aaron Wall, who published a space-time theorem that applies throughout the quantum gravity era on the assumption that the space-time quantum fluctuations are not extremely large. But he's got a few paragraphs at the end of the paper that says, the space-time theorems may hold even if the quantum space-time fluctuations are large, as large as what Sean Carroll says. So he's basically pointing out Sean Carroll not only needs the quantum space-time fluctuations to be very large, he needs a special circumstance uh, to make his quantum eternity theorem work. Now, what I've been writing about in my Today's New Reason to Believe blogs is how we're now developing techniques to determine what's going on in the quantum gravity era without having to build uh, a particle accelerator uh, that's 10 billion light years long. Uh, because those quantum space-time fluctuations in the quantum gravity era, uh, for quasars and blazars that are billions of light years away, those quantum space-time fluctuations will be magnified as the beam of light travels to the Earth which would predict that those images would be blurry if indeed the quantum space-time fluctuations are as large as what uh, Sean Carroll claims. We astronomers observe distant quasars and blazars and the images are sharp. We see no blurring, which puts a constraint on these speculations. Now, I've written articles making the point we can come up with a much better constraint because the greater the distance, uh, the sharper the constraint you get and the shorter the wavelength. What's been done so far is to look at quasars and blazars three billion light years away at ultraviolet wavelengths. We could choose to look at quasars and blazars 12 billion light years away at X-ray and gamma ray wavelengths. That hasn't been done yet, 
but that's one way we can get an even greater constraint. Uh, and also, uh, we're on the verge of coming up with detailed maps of what happens outside the event horizon of the supermassive black hole and the center of our galaxy. That's another way to constrain these speculations. Now, the results are this. The more we learn about the quantum gravity era, uh, the more impossible an atheistic interpretation becomes. And we're predicting it reasons to believe that will continue. However, uh, Sean Carroll and others like him are basically saying, we will not become a theist until we eliminate all possible atheistic speculations. And basically, I'm saying to the Sean Carrolls of the world, that will never happen. It's impossible. We'd have to learn everything about the universe in order to eliminate all those speculations. And you'll actually see something in the fourth edition of The Creator and the Cosmos where I use the analogy of my being married to my wife for four decades. I have lots of practical proof that she exists and is a physical human being, but I lack absolute proof that she's a physical human being. It's possible I've been fooled for these four decades by a very sophisticated three-dimensional hologram. <laughs> but practically speaking, that possibility is relatively remote. Moreover, as I continue to do experiments and observations, the evidence I gain that she's a real physical being <laughs> accumulates with respect to time. The same thing's true as we study the universe. And that's the test that the Bible encourages us to put into effect. Learn more about nature and see if it doesn't give you more evidence for the supernatural handiwork of God. What I tell the Sean Carrolls of the world, 100% of the observational experimental evidence we have in the universe tells us there's a beginning to the universe. Uh, these atheists cannot point to any empirical evidence. In fact, I have a chapter in the book called how to respond to non-empirical arguments for atheism. But to me, I think that's a remarkable uh, advance of the Christian faith, is that these atheists are now limited to only non-empirical arguments for their religious belief. And if you want to see that dramatically played out, you can go online and watch a debate I had with a British chemist, Peter Atkins. And, you know, he appeals to these non-empirical arguments. Um, do you believe in extraterrestrial life? Like, not just like aliens walking around on Mars, but like, at least like a plant on another planet? Okay, good question. Do I believe in extraterrestrial life? I've been on record since the 1980s that we will find the remains of life on the moon and possibly even Mars. Not because life originated there, but because Earth is so prolific with life that every time a big meteor hits the Earth, it sends dust and soil from the Earth into interplanetary space. In fact, some friends of mine published a paper where they calculated there's 20,000 kilograms of Earth's soil on every 100 square kilometers surface of the Moon. Now, I've been writing articles making the point we need to go back to the Moon and find that Earth-transported soil because Earth's geology has destroyed the fossils of Earth's first life, but the Moon has virtually no geological activity. We can go to the Moon, and we will find the fossils of Earth's first life. And if we find those fossils, we can determine who got it right, uh, the theists or the non-theists. In fact, I spoke on this topic at NASA Houston a few years ago, saying, last time I checked, 100% of the U.S. taxpayer base was either a theist or an atheist, and therefore we should all be excited about going to the moon and proving who got it right. However, I think your question is, is there a possibility of finding extraterrestrial life independent of life here on Earth? And, you know, Earth has infected the solar system, but not other planetary systems. And Back in 1995, we discovered the first planets outside of our solar system. Uh, you can go on exoplanet.eu, uh, and there they maintain a catalog that you can read for yourself. It's over 4,100 planets that have been discovered and measured to date. And the prediction back in 1995 was these extrasolar planets will be just like the planets in our solar system. 
Well, now it's 19 or 2019, we've yet to find a single planet outside the solar system that's a twin of any of the planets in our solar system. And that led to the discovery that every planet in our solar system plays a critical role in making advanced life possible here on planet Earth. So if there's gonna be extraterrestrial life, it needs to be in a planetary system that's got a sun that's exactly like our sun with planets that are exactly like our planets. The probability of that happening is virtually zero. Everywhere we look in the universe and our galaxy, we see conditions that are hostile for life. Just a few days ago, I gave a lecture at Regent University making the point, we have not found a single star that's sufficiently like the sun to be a candidate. We've not found any planets that could be candidates. We've not found any galaxies that are sufficiently like our galaxy to be a candidate. We've not found any galaxy clusters that are sufficiently like ours to be a candidate. We've not found any super galaxy clusters that are sufficiently like ours to be a candidate. No matter what size scale you look at, we are unique. Moreover, the entire universe must be exactly the mass that it is and the size that it is to make life possible on even one planet in the universe. That entire universe of 200 billion galaxies must exist exactly the way it is to make possible one planet. Do you think God loves you? He loved you enough that he created 50 billion trillion stars so that you could have one planet on which you could live. Now, make the universe slightly more massive, no life is possible. Make it slightly less massive, no life is possible. You can't even get the chemistry right unless the universe has exactly the mass that it is and you can't get the planets you need unless the universe is exactly the size that it is at just the right time in which human life can exist here in the universe. It's fine-tuned everywhere you look. As um, the agnostic astronomer Paul Davies wrote in his book, The Cosmic Blueprint, the evidence for design is overwhelming and it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So thanks for the question. Okay, we're gonna I really apologize. There's going to be one more. We've got to keep it brief, Dr. Ross, because we have to give a, a time okay. for a transition. Excuse me. Uh, the Young Earth uh, advocates say that the rapid regeneration of Mount St. Helens and the abundance of megalodon shark teeth on the ocean floor support their point of view. Would you go over that, please? Sure, and what was that stuff on the ocean floor? The megalodon shark teeth. Oh yeah, okay. <clears throat> well, as far as Mount St. Helens goes, uh, they're basically saying that uh, you can get this you know, rapid deposition, and uh, it's a volcano. Um, and the fallacy in young earth creationism is that they keep pointing out to you the rapid geological processes that occur, and they do occur but there's also ones that are very gradual. And so they try to frame the old Earth, young Earth debate as one of uh, catastrophism uh, versus, uh, I forget the term they use, uniformitarianism. The truth is, modern geology is a combination of the two. It's catastrophism interleaved with uniformitarianism. And the uniformitarianism fundamentally says the laws of physics don't change. Every young Earth model critically depends on radically altered laws of physics at the fall of Adam or the flood of Noah or both. But the Bible repeatedly declares the laws of physics do not change. I mean, I'll give you an example, uh, Jeremiah 33, uh, where God says to the Jews, you change your mind all the time, but I'm a God that does not change. As proof that I do not change, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they do not change, I do not change. And this is what makes science possible. This is why the book of nature is a reliable revelation from God. It's based on constant physics. And as an astronomer, uh, we get our data from the past. Uh, we have no knowledge of the present because of the velocity of light. But we can look at the sun and we can measure physics eight minutes ago. Uh, we can look at the Andromeda galaxy and measure physics two and a half million years ago because of the velocity of light. And when we look at distant galaxies and stars, we can measure the laws of physics in those galaxies and stars. Those laws of physics measure to be exactly the same 
as we measure in the lab today. So the Bible says there's no change, and the book of nature says there's no change. And uh, you know, as I am engaging my fellow young earth creationists, engineers, and scientists, they all admit that this is a critical point. You even see it in the rate study uh, produced by the Institute for Creation Research, the first large young earth creationist organization. What they say in the rate study, if the laws of physics do not change, the earth is billions of years old. So they themselves are aware of that point. But I would argue you've got biblical evidence that indeed the laws of physics don't change. 